If I told you that Ukraine is planning to build new nuclear reactors at the Chernobyl site, you might think that I am crazy, right? But I'm not, and it's actually being considered today. So let us first check what is going on. Ukraine is considering the Chernobyl nuclear power plant as a site to develop SMRs, small modular reactors. So what are small modular reactors? There's a lot that can be said about it. The ones that are currently being considered by the Ukraine are much the same as light water reactors, large ones like the EP-1000 or, you know, if you drive past a um, nuclear reactor, chances are big that it is a light water reactor. Uh, except when you live in Canada, for instance, then the chances are that you that you drive past a pressurized heavy water reactor, which is slightly different than a light water reactor. And if you live in the UK, chances are that your uh, local nuclear reactor is actually a gas cool reactor. So they are really different from the light water reactors. The ones that we are talking about here right now, those are light water reactors. And those are basically uh, the, the bread and butter nuclear reactors that are built all over the world. Now, if we talk about SMR, small modular reactors, then basically what we are talking about is the same as a large light water reactor, but then scaled down. And it's it's scaled down in, in terms of power output. Doesn't mean that you get a miniature reactor, you know, the size of a truck. It's still a, quite a large building that you need to put, you know, somewhere. Um, consider, you know, maybe a building that is 150 meters long, maybe 80 meters wide and 50 meters tall. If you could, if you compare that to a AP-1000, for instance, a AP-1000 would be one and a half times as big in terms of the entire building layout, the entire building volume. So the smaller, the small modular reactor, yes, it's smaller. It's smaller physically. It's smaller in terms of uh, power output. But because the, uh, you know, the, the, the smaller scale of this reactor doesn't exactly scale linearly in terms of how much materials you have to put in, this means that the electricity that comes from the small modular reactor is slightly higher than the one, than the electricity that you get from the larger reactor. But since the investment needed for a small modular reactor is substantially lower, for instance, if you want to build an X300, for instance, what people think is that the cost for an X300 is going to fall somewhere between one and a half billion and three billion US dollars. A large AP-1000 will cost you, let's say, somewhere between 8 and $12 billion. So the cost for entry into the nuclear space is much lower, and this makes it an interesting candidate for uh, places where you don't have as much uh, bandwidth or where the demand simply isn't as high. So SMRs are interesting. I, I'm not saying that they are superior. I'm not saying that large water reactors are superior. I think that they all have a viable uh, place where they can do their work. So what are we going to see in this video? Um, I'm going to tell you why Ukraine wants more nuclear power. I'm going to give you some background about Chernobyl. I'm going to give you some background about the existing nuclear power plants in the Ukraine. And I'm going to show you which designs are considered. So let's go to the uh, news first, World Nuclear News, Chernobyl considered as a site for new small modular reactors. The area around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is one of the places being looked at, looked at as potential locations for Ukraine's planned future wave of small reactors. So representatives of the state agency of Ukraine on exclusion zone management and specialists from Ukraine's nuclear energy giant Energo Atom joined Chernobyl nuclear power plant officials last month to visit several areas within the exclusion zone and around the plant, CNPP reported. This was followed by a technical discussion on the suitability of these sites for future SMR construction. And this is interesting. On Saturday at the COP29 UN Climate Conference in Baku, Azerbaijan, U.S. Undersecretary of State Arms Control and International Security, Bonnie Jenkins, and Ukraine Minister of Energy, Herman Halushenko, announced three project partnerships. 
to build a pilot plant in Ukraine to demonstrate the production of clean hydrogen and ammonia using simulated safe and secure small modular reactor technology. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that the heat output of this uh, power plant, whichever it is, is similar to that of a small modular reactor and is then used to power hydrogen and ammonia synthesis. Um, the project is being carried out by a multinational pri public-private consortium from Japan, South Korea, Ukraine, and the USA. Project Phoenix funding to help facilitate the transition of Ukraine's coal-fired power plants to SMR nuclear power plants, carrying out siting and feasibility studies, and to develop a roadmap and provide technical support to rebuild, modernize, and decarbonize Ukraine's steel industry with SMRs. The roadmap will pave the way for using clean electricity, process heat, and hydrogen from SMRs for clean steel manufacturing and production. And these are exactly the types of things that you want SMRs for. Repowering a coal plant, uh, powering a steel uh, plant, for instance, because I did a scan of the German electricity uh, network, the electricity infrastructure uh, the other the other week. And what you see is that the number of gigawatt scale plants in Germany it, it is relatively low compared to the number of uh, smaller sub 600 megawatt power plants that are situated right next to a factory like ThyssenKrupp, like uh, ArcelorMittal, for instance, where they produce steel, they often have their own power plants. Now, what we need to keep in mind is that if you have a steel plant, if you if you have if if you have a blast oven furnaces, for instance, you also get a lot of syngas, and syngas is uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, which you then add some hydrogen hydrogen to, and, and this basically uh, can be burned. And, and what they do with this syngas is they, they put that into a power plant, which is on site, and, and that is often a power plant, you know, in the several hundred megawatt scale. So they can power their own production with some of the byproducts that they get from steel baking. Uh, and, and if if we want to uh, move to a future where we don't use carbon steel anymore, but we use steel that was, was produced with hydrogen, then we don't get the syngas anymore. So, and if you don't have the syngas, you can't burn uh, the syngas in order to make your own power, uh, in which case you do need another power plant that is in the several hundred megawatt scale and that can power your uh, factory. So that's why uh, these plants are being considered. If you look at the energy, the electricity generation uh, graph in uh, Ukraine, you can see that over here, this is, I don't know, it's it's green or whatever color it is, your green, bluish green. Uh, nuclear used to be the largest source of electricity in Ukraine. They also use some oil, gas, and coal. And then there is some very marginal bioenergy, solar, wind, and hydropower there, and and that's 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 strange because they use they used to have large dams like the Nova Kohovka Dam, which was destroyed by the Russians uh, earlier this year. Now the trouble in Ukraine, as we currently see it, so so over here I have a map of Ukraine. I hope that you can see uh, the the borders. So I'm, I'm tracing the borders with my with my mouse at this moment. I can also uh, draw a map. Now the trouble that we have in Ukraine is that at, at this moment, this part of Ukraine, right, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing it as we speak, is being occupied by the Russians, right? Uh, and that's something that really needs to be uh, finished. Uh, we need an end to this war. Now, I believe that the end of this war can only be achieved on favorable terms of Ukraine because Ukraine has been invaded. It's their sovereignty that has been violated. So this is something that really needs to stop. The war needs to stop and resume normal life because too many people have been killed. And uh, this is uh, a, a big problem for all different parties concerned. Now, what we see over here, right, we see the, the purple place markers that Saparija, the South Ukraine nuclear plant, Khmelnytsky, uh, over here we get Rivne, and over here we have Chernobyl. Now, these are the plants that are semi-operational. Obviously, Chernobyl isn't, it isn't operational today, 
but I made it purple because SMRs being con are being considered there. So first we're going to zoom in uh, on, on one of the largest nuclear power plants that is currently in occupied is currently in occupied territories. Right. So what we see over here, uh, this is the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We have six uh, light water reactors, Russian made light water reactors, and they are all in cold shutdown at this moment. There's also a coal nuclear, not a nuclear, there's also a coal plant right next to it. I believe that it may also be uh, capable of burning oil uh, because of these, uh, these, these large containers there. So, but I don't know whether this is still operational or, or not, because there were some problems with the power uh, infrastructure, which meant that people were getting nervous. As you can see, it has its own large cooling reservoir right next to the plant. And that's important because the, the Dnipro River is dammed as well, right? So you can see if I zoom out, it, it suddenly turns uh, green and 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 and. and sand color and and the the issue is that the russians blew up a dam which is over here right here so this is the Novokohovka dam and the Novokohovka dam has been damaged by the russians it was deliberate sabotage and basically that that has meant that the dnipro river um reservoir this used to be a large reservoir it has now been drained and the river is still flowing but it's flowing in a natural way so currently uh, this reservoir is the only thing that this nuclear power plant has in order to power, in order to cool its reactor cores, which are in cold shutdown. Now, if we go to the north, so over here we have Kiev. Kiev is also on the Dnipro River, right? So over here you have another reservoir. There's another dam over here somewhere, I believe. Here's here's the dam. Uh, that dam has also been attacked by Russians. So. Um, those are basically signs that what you get is that if you have a nuclear power plant, usually um, a belligerent is, you know, someone like someone like Russia is not keen on actually attacking it, destroying it, because if you destroy a nuclear power plant, I mean, everybody knows who has done it and everybody knows, uh, you know, where to point the fingers. And if they would have done something to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, for instance, that would have drawn major repercussions from other countries. Uh, they could have been economical. They could they, they, they could also be military. We don't know because uh, if you, for instance, get a lot of fallout from these reactors and that fallout lands, let's say, in Romania or in Poland or uh, in one of the Baltic states, what is going to happen is that they are going to invoke Article 5, and that means war between Russia and NATO. And that's something that everybody involved wants to avoid at all costs. So that's one of the principal reasons why I believe that nothing real is ever going to happen at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Also interesting to know is that if you look at these, you have these orange uh, circular buildings over here that's the that's basically the nuclear containment building uh, the nuclear containment containment building you have to you have to imagine is something like a, a a large thick walled steel cylinder i believe that it's like five centimeters thick and that is surrounded by half a meter of uh, reinforced concrete so if you really want to you know if if, if you want to destroy these things you really have to make a, a, a big show about it. You know, you have to use some real fireworks in order to crack these containment domes and actually uh, precipitate a nuclear disaster. So I don't believe, I, I really don't believe that anyone is uh, is planning to do something like that. Um, so let's see, uh, where are we? Uh, yes, so why Ukraine needs more nuclear power? It's, it, it's pretty obvious uh, when we look at uh, when we look at the electricity generation map, Ukraine already uses a lot of nuclear. They know that wind and solar, uh, you know, that they can't get a industrialized nation like the Ukraine. Ukraine really has heavy industry. Uh, they can't power industry, uh, even though many people want you to believe that, that, that renewables can power industry. The only two renewables that might be able to power industry are uh, hydroelectric dams and geothermal. 
but wind and solar, forget about it. And bioenergy is as dirty as it gets. So this is why uh, Ukraine wants nuclear. It's 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 a safe form of electricity. It's 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 a form of electricity that people don't just you know attack because everybody is going to become really really mad at you when you do something like that. And it's it's a reliable source of electricity. Now the irony is that we're going to zoom into Chernobyl right now. And we're, <laughs> I just was talking about the reliability of of of, of nuclear energy. Now. Uh, let's go to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant itself. So what you see here is you have one reactor building, you have another reactor building. So this is one, two, unit three, and unit four. Unit four is currently underneath this huge uh, semicircular uh, containment building, and that's been put in place there in order to do uh, deconstruction work on the damaged reactor. So what went wrong at Chernobyl? I mean, this was pretty much a disastrous, uh, disastrous uh, event. What they did was they tried something uh, that, that really was inadvisable. They shut down all the cooling pumps. And then when they wanted to uh, shut down the reactor to make sure that it would cool down, uh, their control rods were badly designed, uh, which basically meant that they, they, they had these graphite tips and, and, and the issue with graphite is that if you have a fast neutron and it moves through graphite, it slows down. The graphite sm slows it down. And at that moment, the reactor, the reactor actually became more reactive instead of less reactive. Also, when it heated up, it, it, it also became more reactive. So it, it heated up. The, the shutdown rods didn't work the way they should. And it be, the, the, basically the reactions went faster and more intense and we got more reactions. So the number of reactions increased. The, the reactor became hotter. The, the water couldn't really... Uh, the, the trouble is water is an incompressible fluid. At, at some point it wants to become a gas. And, and, and that's what precipitated a, a, a huge steam explosion, which basically blew the lid out of the reactor building. Now, if you look at these reactor buildings, you can't really see it from the outside, but they are not uh, as sturdy as those reactor containment buildings in Zaporizhia. And in fact, they did not have any real containment buildings to speak of. This is just a, a, a glorified factory hall with a relatively thin roof. And when you have a steam explosion that pushes outward with an immense force, then everything that is that is in its path will simply get destroyed. And that's what happened at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Now, everybody thinks, and this is a mistaken belief, that the entire zone here is highly radioactive and that no humans can 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 be there. This is this is wrong. Uh, first of all, um, I believe one uh, two of these units actually stayed in operation until 2001, I believe. So 13 or 14 years after this reactor uh, blew up, uh, there were still uh, activities in the other reactors. As a matter of fact, uh, there's, there's thousands of people working at this site every day, and they have been working there ever, ever since the, the nuclear disaster in 1986. Now, the issue is here, and you have this radioactivity, yes, but the radioactivity is not that bad that you really can't do anything else there. There's still thousands of people working here. Uh, you still have the infrastructure, right? I mean, uh, y y you have access to water. There should be a giant switchyard over here. There's still electri electri electricity lines running uh, from here to Kiev. So there's there's there there's plenty of opportunity to actually do something new with nuclear over here and many people would think that 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 would be crazy but honestly i don't believe that it is i think that this is the perfect site to do something new with nuclear and um i really think that ukraine should pursue it it would be the ultimate uh it would be the ultimate proof that nuclear isn't as dangerous as many people think now what kind of technology is being uh, considered for these uh, plants. So we have large reactors. I believe that all, uh, all in all nine AP-1000s are considered for Ukraine, and the AP-1000 is 
the reactor that has just, or, or is the reactor technology that has just become operational in the United States. So in this picture, you see uh, Vogel 3 and 4, and both of them are currently producing electricity. There are also four EP1000s operational in China today. Uh, and, and I think that this is uh, really a great design. And, and if you want to build large water react large light water reactors, this is the way to go. At this moment, the Netherlands is considering uh, AP-1000 along with, along with APR-1300, along with APR-1400 and EPRs from France. So the APR-1400 is from South Korea. And as you can see, Poland is currently constructing uh, three AP-1000s at their own north coast. Bulgaria is uh, looking to build AP-1000s. Ukraine wants to build nine AP-1000s. Then we have India, six AP-1000s. And if we look at China, uh, four AP-1000s are in operation today and another six are under construction. Now, unfortunately, this is a very small map. So let me let me see if I can enlarge it a little bit so you can see it. So uh, two AP-1000s in operation in the United States, one being selected in Bulgaria, three being uh, constructed in, in, in Poland, nine being contracted in, in Ukraine, uh, six being selected in India, and another six under construction in China. So the AP-1000, uh, those are the ones that they're going to build in Ukraine. And the other technology that I know of currently is Holtec. So over here, you can see a, uh, this is, this is, this is, uh, basically uh, what they envision that a Holtec 300 megawatt reactor will look like in the future. So Holtec's uh, UK subsidiary obtains crucial first step regulatory approval for its SMR 300 pressurized water reactor. Now this is in the UK, but I can imagine that the UK and uh, Ukraine uh, basically uh, they, they can work off each other's regulatory work if they want to. And I don't know uh, what the, uh, the, st the status of uh, the SMR 300 in regulation, in terms of regulations is in the United States, but I, I guess that it is moving along. Uh, it's probably not going to be, uh, you know, it's not like we're going to be able to construct these within the next two years or so. We might possibly expect that the first construction of a whole tech 300 megawatt reactor is going to start somewhere between 2027 and 2030. I believe that's, 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 that's basically what we can expect. Over here, we see Ukraine's Energo Atom and Holtec International sign a master agreement for establishing of an advanced manufacturing infrastructure for building capital nuclear equipment and components in Ukraine. So what you see over here, I mean, I mean, this goes further than just building nuclear reactors alone. Here they say, yes, uh, not only are we going to try to build uh, Holtec uh, 300 megawatt reactors in Ukraine, we're also going to make sure that a lot of the manufacturing equipment that is needed to build the components for these plants is going to be built in Ukraine as well. And, and this is something that many people uh, don't get about Ukraine, is that it is a uh, sovereign nation. It is a nation that has hopes and dreams for its own people. And nuclear is probably the best way to make sure uh, that you that you stay in the race, that you keep, uh, that you increase your competitiveness on the international market. But for that to happen, uh, first, all the Russians have to withdraw from Ukraine and some kind of a peace deal needs to be uh, reached. And, and this is going to be incredibly, incredibly hard. The question is whether Russia will uh, completely withdraw from Ukraine or not. We don't know. It all depends on you know, on Ukraine, on Russia, on what the United States is willing to do. Uh, it's simply all up in the air at this moment. So we don't know uh, what uh, the end result will be, whether it will be a frozen conflict, whether whether there will be a, a, a bilateral peace agreement. We don't know. We don't know. All of that is up in the air at this moment. In any case, I want to end on a positive note. And that positive note is that you have made it through uh, to the end of this video. I want to thank you for your patience with me. Uh, now, if you thought that this 
video was informative and if you learned anything new please consider to subscribe and leave a like if you want to contribute to the discussion please leave a message down below in the comments section and if you want to support the channel you can do so by visiting my patreon page and becoming a paying member and with that i want to thank you for watching and may the strong force be with you bye bye